So uh, my talk today is on uh, parameterized uh, partial differential equations, or PPDEs for short, uh, applied to heat transfer. And in particular, heat transfer back of the envelope calculations, admittedly a somewhat odd topic. Uh, I would like to uh, acknowledge my collaborators, uh, both my uh, professional colleagues, as indicated here, but also the undergraduate students in my intermediate heat and mass transfer class 251, who will provide uh, much of the data that I discuss in terms of back of the envelope. Uh, so let me start then uh, with perspective and a definition taken from, of course, the ultimate source, Wikipedia, of back of the envelope. It says a back of the envelope calculation, and for those of you that have never used an envelope, the younger generation, <laughs> they, they look like this. They're about this size. They're paper, and they can be used with uh, pen artifacts. Uh, a back of the envelope calculation is a rough calculation typically jotted down on any available scrap of paper such as an envelope. It is more than a guess but less than an accurate calculation or mathematical proof. And the defining characteristic of back of the envelope calculations is the use of simplified assumptions. All right, so that's the back of the envelope. So questions to ponder in the year 2020, uh, not 1870 but 2020, uh, is uh, why do we teach students, and we do, back of the envelope, succinct, transparent, fast, quasi-accurate methods of engineering analysis still in 2020, arguably the age of large-scale computation. Uh, today, my focus will be macro-scale heat transfer, primarily external flows that involve conduction, primarily natural convection due to buoyancy, and radiation between solid bodies. And I will consider macro-scale heat transfer in the context of everyday life. These are all case studies from my 251 student uh, projects involving heat transfer in everyday life. And they're pedagogically very instructive because we have already developed intuition and now we can develop quantification. So those will be some of the examples from today. And uh, to relate back to the back of the envelope, uh, I would claim that the formulation of all of these problems in some sense lies within the span or some appropriate combination of formulations uh, for four canonical problems, the wall, the fin, the dunk, or the dunking, and a semi-infinite body. And so I will start by describing one of those, the uh, dunk, and leave the others for, as homework, and then on the basis of that indicate how I think we can uh, describe how a back of the envelope might formalize, formalize the process. Is time up already? Was that? Uh, all right, so uh, heat transfer 101. Uh, and I'll start with the continuum truth, which is conjugate formulation of, uh, con of the conduction problem dunk or dunking, all right, as in, as in dunking a piece of, of food might, uh, might be one example. So speaking of food, uh, here's an example. This is a case of dunking. You take a cookie, which is hot from the oven, and you immerse it or dunk it in cold air. So uh, S is solid domain and temperature, F is fluid, which is air, domain and temperature, T infinity, far field temperature, gamma SF and TSF refer to the uh, interface and the temperature at the uh, boundary or the interface between the solid and the fluid. So that is pre-simplification. You can see it's actually quite complicated. That's a thermocouple inserted into its center. Uh, here's the post-simplification, and it's very similar. Omega solid, omega fluid, temperature fluid, temperature solid, interface, large enclosure, coordinate system, initial conditions, uh, but it's now a smooth domain, it's convex, and I'll introduce a scale parameter L associated with that domain. So what are uh, the governing equations? Well, first let me give you, for those of you who are not heat transfer, do not do heat transfer for a living, a little intuition about these solutions. All right, so here is this cookie being unceremoniously measured in calipers, all right, and it's been, it has a thermocouple in its center, heated up, it's immersed in the air, we plot the temperature as a function of time, and what you see is following a short flat period in exponential decay. All right, so that's what you might expect. A second experiment uh, is a hot bagel from the toaster oven now placed uh, on its side against the wall. Uh, but now we look at the surface temperature, and uh, you'll notice your eye can probably pick up, or at least your eye, not the ordinary eye, can pick up what looks like a square root function here. And in fact, depending on where you look at the temperature, you get very different temporal ev uh, evolution. That, of course, is an indication that the underlying phenomena can be described by a partial differential equation, which is the uh, essential piece of mathematics in this talk. Uh, I'd also like to talk a little bit about the boundary conditions. So these are two uh, innocent potatoes. One has been wrapped in aluminum foil. The other is uh, bare, as it were. Uh, 
Uh, aluminum foil has the property of turning off thermal radiation. It has an emissivity of something close to zero. And so uh, what I show in the next plot is how these two potatoes cool. So the blue is foil wrapped, where we have turned off radiation, and the potato will cool slowly. The unwrapped potato cools more quickly. Why is that? Because it has both natural convection cooling as well as radiation. So you can see from this simple curve that even for everyday experiences, both thermal radiation through Stefan Boltzmann and natural convection through the Boussinesque equations are essentially of commensurate importance in cooling uh, these objects at, at these regular uh, temperatures. So how do we describe that? Uh, these are the governing equations in dimensional form. V is the velocity, T is the temperature, S solid, F fluid. This is uh, Navier-Stokes equations. Beta is the coupling uh, between the temperature uh, and the fluid through the uh, coefficient of thermal expansion. Uh, incompressibility, Boussinesque, fluid temperature, solid temperature. Interface condition, of course, couples the fluid and the solid through continuity of flux to the flux uh, due to conduction and Fourier and uh, the heat transfer due to Stefan Boltzmann and radiation. Uh, so that makes for a difficult set of equations. Uh, we will make them look nicer, though no more, no more easy to solve by non-dimensionalization. Capital theta uh, is the non-dimensional temperature. Ra is the Rayleigh number, which measures the importance of buoyancy and hence the strength of the flow and the effectiveness of the heat transfer. In non-dimensional form, we get a set of equations that are very, this is what happens when you give somebody not sufficiently mature, too many colors, all right? So, so uh, here what I've tried to mark is the, uh, the blue is the uh, parameters of the problem. So prandtl rayleigh prandtl rayleigh conductivity ratio, thermal diffusivity ratio. So again, all of the same equations, but now we have only four parameters that appear. Uh, I'm sorry, five, including the uh, radiation term. And so this is now a, a, a parameterized PDE with five parameters, same equations as before that govern the physics. All right, so uh, in general, I will try to use blue for parameters to highlight that important aspect of the mapping from parameter to solution. Uh, these equations uh, have been known for many decades. They are hardly ever used by the heat transfer community because they are very coupled and you would need to solve a fully nonlinear problem in, t in several field variables over a very large domain. And that's not how you make uh, engineering predictions for complicated situations in general. So what the engineers developed is, is a remarkable artifact, which is the heat transfer coefficient, which first was used in a slightly different context by Sir Isaac Newton, probably in between when he did the first law and the second law. Uh, and so let me introduce that concept uh, and show you how it greatly simplifies the situation and plays an important role in actual engineering analysis. So here again, we have a solid and a fluid. Let's say the wall is isothermal at T wall and the wall itself is gamma wall. Let's forget the solid and just say it provides a wall that's isothermal and I'd like to, provide the, I'd like to find the flux, Q wall, from the solid into the fluid. So we define a heat transfer coefficient it's spatially averaged for the isothermal wall. It's equal to the total heat transfer uh, to the fluid divided by the area of the wall and the temperature difference between the wall and the far field temperature. And the total Q wall is the integral of the heat flux ds. All right, one's per meter squared, one is total heat transfer rate. Well, you can uh, rearrange that to get what was Newton's law of cooling. Total heat transfer is the heat transfer coefficient times area times delta t. And uh, we know that Q wall from Fourier's law is conductivity, the gradient of the temperature, but we can estimate the gradient of the temperature as the temperature difference between the wall and the fluid divided by the distance over which that temperature variation occurs, which is known as the boundary layer. And what you can show, and here's a visualization from one of my 251 students, uh, you can see the boundary layer as this irregular speckle, and you can see that in fact it grows initially, but then is relatively constant, and in fact grows like x to the 1 fourth, which will approximate as x to the 0, which means that the heat flux then is approximately uniform, given by the heat transfer coefficient times area times delta t. So how can we use that? Well, now we go back to the solid side, and we'll use that as a boundary condition. And so, uh, again, here's the wall, and now we're looking at the solid side, and we know that the flux from the solid side is the flux from the fluid side. The flux from the fluid side is the heat flux Qw, but Qw is the heat transfer coefficient times delta t. But that delta t is T fluid, but T fluid is equal to T solid. So this is the, uh, the magic of the heat transfer coefficient, is all of the fluid has been replaced 
by this single coefficient. And we no longer need to solve a coupled field problem. We solve only a problem on the solid domain by virtue of this decoupling constant. All right? So that's why you need to know the heat transfer coefficient to appreciate how engineering uh, calculations are typically done uh, in practice. But of course, this is only true, remember our assumption that the wall is isothermal. So we have to know under what conditions is the isothermal wall from which we derived this coefficient in fact applicable. And it turns out that there's a, another magic uh, uh, heat transfer uh, concept, which is the BO number. The BO number is the heat transfer coefficient times the length scale divided by the conductivity of the solid. If this number is much less than one, it sort of means that the conductivity is very high. If the conductivity is high, then Fourier's law says I will not tolerate many gradients, in the, uh, large gradients in the temperature. I will smooth them out. And so that means that in this limit, the temperature is roughly uniform. Therefore, the wall temperature is roughly uniform. And therefore, I can apply this heat transfer coefficient that I developed ex situ, if you like, in order to apply to any given problem that I might look at. All right. So this is a, a very powerful uh, heat transfer coefficient concept, and we would need to check BO number. But in fact, it applies when the BO number is both much less than 1, and by different arguments, for much, uh, BO number is much larger than 1, it's also isothermal. And then you use a well-known lemma that if something works for small BO and something works for high BO, then something works for all BO. Okay. And so in fact, that's actually uh, roughly true. All right. So experimentalists can measure this and they non-dimensionalize it, and uh, this is the Nusselt number. It's the heat transfer coefficient times the body length scale divided by the conductivity, this should say, of the fluid, not of the solid, Kf. This is the Rayleigh number, and you can show that the Nusselt number is just a function of Rayleigh and Prandtl, and uh, the uh, experimentalist then would develop uh, a correlation, a fit to data, that given the parameters, Rayleigh and Prandtl, returns the uh, Nusselt number and therefore the heat transfer coefficient. Here's an example, a little bit of data. This is big data, heat transfer style. It's a correlation of the Nusselt number, non-dimensional heat transfer coefficient, over tens of thousands of experiments probably as a function of Rayleigh and Prandtl. This is a vertical plate, natural convection. This is a horizontal cylinder, natural convection. So you need a heat transfer coefficient. You go here, calculate Ray Rayleigh, calculate Prandtl, look up, and you got it. All right, And that replaces the fluid. All right, so where do we... Uh, uh, how do we include this into our formulation? Well, this is again the dunk problem, uh, but this is now uh, the classical formulation. So here's our cookie minding its own business. This is the same formulation as before. But now I only need to solve a heat equation in the solid domain, and the fluid domain is replaced by a heat transfer coefficient times the difference between the surface temperature and T infinity. So a much easier equation to solve. And furthermore, uh, these, uh, the heat transfer coefficient has a convection and a radiation piece, the radiation piece from Stefan Boltzmann, the convection piece from what we just derived, eta bar iso, that's our heat transfer coefficient for convection, subscript C. We can keep it nonlinear, which depends on the surface temperature, or we can linearize, and often when we linearize, we evaluate the heat transfer coefficient at the initial temperature of the body, which is justified if, in fact, the body is not deviating too far from initial temperature during the course of the experiment. And so uh, this could be, in fact, not only a simple parabolic PDE, but a linear parabolic PDE. In non-dimensional form, uh, we again have BO numbers. This is BO number based on initial temperature for convection and radiation. So these are the BO numbers. Together, they combine to BO. This is a different time scale, Fourier. But we end up with basically a heat equation with a uh, Robin boundary condition, which is dictated by these BO numbers. And I'd like to pay uh, particular attention to the case in which uh, the phenomenon is linear. So we've linearized the heat transfer coefficients. These two functions are then unity. The BO numbers combine. And that means that the temperature uh, is uh, governed by a linear PDE. This is the dunking problem. And there are only essentially uh, one uh, parameter independent of the independent variables, which is the BO number. So that replaces the entire set of equations I showed before. But we can go further, all right? And this is what uh, undergraduates and engineers in particular like. Uh, we introduce a magic geometric length scale, L dunk, which is just the volume over the surface area, which is like a length scale, of course. And if the BO numbers times this magic length scale is much less than one, it turns out, because the BO is small, that the temperature is roughly uniform over the entire body. So in that case, we can uh, eliminate the spatial variable, 
And I will call this uh, the temperature dunking small bo number nonlinear. And it gov is governed by an ordinary differential equation. So we've taken that conjugate set of equations, coupled field equations, reduced them down to a heat equation, and reduced that further down to an ODE. Valid if the bo number is sufficiently small. And we can even be more draconian. We can say we're going to look at the linear case. So this is small bo linear for the dunking problem. So I have you just bear that in mind. This is every undergraduate's favorite heat transfer equation. All right. Now, we can do a similar analysis for Finn, but I won't, but I'll show you an example later. Similar for another canonical problem, which is a wall, which is just a technical term for that in the heat transfer context. Uh, and instead, uh, what I'd like to go is how this is now incorporated into the back of the envelope formulation. So first, uh, let me state how I, how I would pose a problem in my class, though we wouldn't quite use this operator notation, but other than that, uh, uh, what are we given? Uh, we're not given how to solve the problem. We're not given the equations. We're not given the appropriate formulation. What we're given is a solid artifact, A, environmental conditions, E, a process, process conditions, P, and an output operator which acts on a field and returns the output of interest. What we'd like to provide is a numeric estimate for the output of interest, O estimate, right, which is essentially this operator applied to the physical temperature field, and a quantitative justification for the proposed answer. Show your work is the way we usually emphasize that second point. All right. Notice this problem statement is non-prescriptive. You don't see any heat transfer in here per se, except through, say, the temperature. All right. The teacher is uh, the source of the given, and the student is the source of the provide through, I would argue, it should be a back-of-the-envelope single-screen script. All right. And so uh, in order, uh, let me give an example. This is the cookie. The environment is the kitchen. The process, you take out the cookie and it cools. The output operator is the time at which it cools to 55 degrees C. And notice again, this is effectively in lay terms. So uh, I said a single screen script. But of course, if I don't tell you what the instruction set is, that doesn't mean anything because you just call some other script. All right, so I have to tell you what the, instru the instruction set is for the back of the envelope and heat transfer. Well, it is a function which returns material properties for any given material. That's obvious, you need that, all right? That's essentially the internet, all right? You need a set of convection heat transfer coefficients. You now know how important those are in, in, in decoupling the problem. So we'll have a set of heat transfer coefficient functions that given parameters return Nusselt numbers. We need a set of radiation heat transfer coefficients which allow us to characterize the uh, radiation. And lastly, we need a set of conduction problem functions for heat transfer uh, between a solid body in communication with the environment through the heat transfer coefficients. And this is our wall, our fin, our dunk, and our semi-infinite body. All right. So what do I mean more precisely by these functions? Well, uh, they're, they're really classes. And we, as applied mathematicians, would think of them as parameterized PDE models. And I've given them letters here so as to be a little less uh, verbose in the description. And uh, let me give you an example of one of these, which is the uh, dunk function for the back of the envelope, uh, M3. Its parameters are the BO number, the magical length scale of the geometry if it's required, and a parameter geotype. And geotype can either be general, parallel pipe, and cylinder or sphere. If geotype is general, we allow any domain for our problem, but we only use the dunking function, which is for small BO and linear. So the general geometry can only be treated if it's small BO. If uh, the geotype is not general, but a parallel pipe or cylinder sphere, then we can treat the general linear heat equation representation for the problem. But notice we only give the student three possible geometries. This is a parallel pipe, but the lateral surfaces are insulated, so it's a one-dimensional in space problem. This is a cylinder one-dimensional in space, a sphere one-dimensional in space. So the students are only armed with three geometries and a general geometry if the BO number is small. All right. And uh, so obviously, there needs to be a process by which to arrive at a simplification such that these are applicable. Right. And what is, how do we do that? Well, you can think, uh, given any problem statement, you can think of defining a notional high fidelity PDE model, M for the problem statement, which takes artifact, environment, and process, returns the geometry and the physical temperature field in the solid, as well as the output. In general, this high fidelity notional PDE uh, will not be and cannot be evaluated, but it exists. All right, it's a platonic PDE. All right, so then what do we do? We choose an n bar from one of our models. Is it a dunk? Is it a wall? Is it a fin? Is it a semi-infinite body? And next, for that particular model, 
we choose a particular instantiation of the model, a particular parameter value, which we will then evaluate our output through the output function will apply to the temperature predicted by that model at that particular parameter value. All right. So how do we arrive uh, at this uh, parameter value and this, this model selection? Well, it's through a transformation process in which we simplify the notional uh, or high fidelity partial differential equation until we arrive at a, uh, a model which conforms to our uh, back of the envelope instruction set for some parameter value within the allowable domain. Now, uh, this is not done really in an ad hoc fashion. It's not just a question of intuition. During the course of a heat transfer class, uh, we give essentially a simplification handbook that includes a set of rules, most of which are derived, though not in class, through sort of fundamental uh, methods of, of analysis. PDE stability results play an important role. If you change the Roban coefficient by a little bit, then you change the solution in H1 by a little bit. All right, well, in heat transfer, that means if you change the heat transfer coefficient by a little bit, then you change the temperature by a little bit. All right, so you have all of these classical results, asymptotic analysis closed forms, uh, which uh, allow, uh, allow you to create these rules for simplification. Some of them are rigorous, many are not. Many require interpretation of much less than, right? Uh, and I should not uh, downplay the importance of ingenuity and students find every year remarkable ways to use this very minimal instruction set to analyze very difficult problems. This is an analysis of a defrosting tray which is uh, sold even though in fact it turns out to have very little heat transfer value uh, and the student was able to discover that through this analysis. All right, so now let me just back up a second before I start to give a few examples. Uh, so, uh, what is the purpose of this back of the envelope? Why don't we just do computation? Well, uh, here's my proposal for why it's important. The first is that this instruction set, you saw how simple it was. You have to have four, three functions for evaluating a PDE. Input BO number, output temperature field for those three geometries plus the geometry. Well, it's used continually by the community, so it has continual verification. In the old days, that was done with charts in a textbook. The charts appeared in 30 editions of the textbook, and the numbers were probably right. And when the students used it, they knew they would get the right answer. All right? So continual verification, be it of software, be it of simple software, be it of textbooks. The instruction sets are all the functions are encapsulated, which prevents blunders. All right? You cannot get at anything except what is available as a parameter. The instruction set functions are fast for design and optimization, which are, after all, the engineering enterprise. And finally, most importantly, they're transparent. You, it allows for assessment of the estimate. Do you believe the simplifications and do you believe the result? And as a result, uh, you, you enable, in some sense, blunder detection within this little single script, uh, uh, single screen script, but also with respect to large scale simulation. If you have a result from a, a back of the envelope calculation which differs by a factor of 10 from a large scale simulation result for some observable or outfit, output of interest, my experience over 40 years indicates that probably the back of the envelope is correct and the large scale simulation is wrong. All right, because of mistakes and errors committed in the input process, in non-dimensionalization, in output, in interpretation, or in errors in the software. All right, and so it's an it, it's a invaluable way of confirming that higher precision results, in fact, are, are valid. All right, so let me give you a few examples. Uh, this is the last time you'll see the cookie, so, so enjoy it. Uh, so uh, again, the, the artifact in this case uh, is our cookie baked actually also by the student uh, over here. Uh, this is with the thermal couple unceremoniously inserted into the center. Uh, the temperature at, of the ambient is about 300 degrees. Uh, the process, you remove the cookie, you measure the cookie center. What you'd like to predict is the temperature as a function of time and when it reaches 55 degrees C. And then we do a validation experiment or the student does a validation experiment with a thermocouple probe. Uh, and, but here is the key part. How do you turn that cookie, which is clearly non-convex, all right, into a problem which is amenable to the instruction set? So in this uh, particular case, uh, the student decided to turn the cookie into a right cylinder of circular cross-section. Seems plausible, all right? Once you have the cookie in this shape, which more or less conserves volume and area, which is what heat transfer cares about, all right? Once you have that configuration, you can go back and you can calculate the heat transfer coefficient for convection and radiation based on the uh, instruction sets for the heat transfer coefficients and using certain rules of thumb. For example, the student unwrapped the cookie vertical surface and treated it as a flat plate. 
Well, that's only valid if the boundary layer thickness of the natural convection is small compared to the radius of the cookie. All right, so that's an example of a simplification justification that the student would need to include in order to be able to pursue uh, that particular rule. Once you have the heat transfer coefficients, you can calculate the BO number and this magical geometric uh, uh, coefficient. And the student found that the BO number times L dunk was, much, was uh, 0.24, which is much less than 1. Now you may say, why is 0.24 much less than 1? Well, if you're an MIT student, it's in the end of the semester, 0.24 is much less than 1. All right, so, so under that argument, you can now apply this dunking analysis uh, for small BO number and linear because you're interested in a time where the temperature is still not at equilibrium but closer to initial so you can linearize about that point. Another example of a simplification rule from the handbook. So once you put all this together, you can then compare with experiment. Uh, the back of the envelope gives 15.9 minutes. The average of three cookies gives 4.4 minutes for the same temperature. Is it very precise? No. Is it reasonably accurate? Yes. If your simulation result says that it gets there in 36 seconds, the simulation result is wrong. Okay. Now, a completely different problem is a bagel half. All right. uh, this is written in German. I presume you would combine them into, into one, in one word. Uh, and so here's a, a bagel half, as I showed you earlier. Uh, and uh, the kitchen is at 20 degrees C. And uh, we remove the bagel and we measure the surface temperature initially 160. We'd like to find out how the temperature, the surface temperature evolves with time. I showed you this example earlier. So again, key step, the student now has to somehow transform that very abstract but existent, if you like, uh, partial differential equation in complex geometry to something in simple geometry that fits within the instruction set. And so the first thing to note, and this is an example of one of these uh, very important simplification rules, is that if you have a body with large lateral extent, there is very little heat transfer out the sides compared to the heat transfer through the thin direction. So you can insulate the sides. So if I now approximate the geometry as a slab with insulated sides, that makes it a one-dimensional problem into the board, and that's what they can solve. And I also fill in the body, all right, because the, it turns out that that's actually valid even for the uh, radiation uh, heat transfer coefficient. And so now, what do we have? We have a geometry which is a slab with one dimensional heat transfer. You calculate the Nusselt number of radiation, you find that the BO number is now 0.5. This student decided that was not small enough, even near the end of the semester, but luckily it was a parallel piped geometry, and as a result, that corresponds to geotype equals parallel piped, and there's a chart in the book or a piece of software on the Mac and you can push a button and get the answer. Does that mean the student is doing nothing? No, the student is doing where the value added is for a heat transfer engineer. The student is finding that there's a simplification that allows you to push one button and get an answer that's probably just about as good as if you did a large scale conjugate heat transfer calculation. Okay. And there's the bagel again. And how does it work? Well, red dots are experiments. The student this time uh, was cautious and actually created allegedly upper and lower bounds based on different linearization points. And you can see that, remarkably, the data, yes, there are some deviations, probably experimental. This is a barbecue thermometer, after all. Uh, that the besides those deviations, you do a very good job. And not only that, the student was correctly able to see that the bounds behave as expected. Added evidence that the simplification rules have been correctly applied. Okay? All right. So the next example is a fin. And I didn't tell you about the fin, and I don't need to, because I'm just going to give you the... Uh, the, the uh, short version. So here's a skillet pan that I often use as examples. It's one thing that's not convenient is bringing it to lecture. It's very heavy. Uh, and as a result, uh, James Penn, who I work with on a number of these projects on the experimental side, created a CAD model and then uh, 3D printed this uh, skillet handle for me, which is, I can hand this around if you like. Uh, anyhow, this, this skillet handle goes right there. Uh, this is uh, what we call a thermal fin. The root is where it attaches to the skillet pan. The tip is what you hold. And this also, you can see, has a hole with the chamfer. A little more detail on the chamfer, quite complicated. Uh, the area in the perimeter uh, vary quite strongly as a function of distance down this skillet handle. Uh, the environment is James's kitchen. James is not your average cook. This is not your average kitchen. That's a uh, thermal imaging camera that you see uh, over here. Uh, and uh, the geometry is quite complex, so you would not want to solve a partial differential equation in that particular domain. Uh, what is the process? We boil water in the skillet pan until it reaches steady state. We remove the water from the skillet pan and immediately measure the temperature here, right, which is what was in contact with the hot water, or we could estimate it if we wished. And we then place the skillet on a trivet and let it cool down. 
So what are the outputs of interest? When we throw out the boiling water, we want to know what is the temperature distribution along the skillet, how hot is it at the tip, which is what you would grasp. And then we'd like to know when it cools down, how quickly does this become holdable, if you like. All right, so very uh, uh, realistic engineering questions. Uh, James did a validation experiment in his not-so-ordinary kitchen, and this is what you get. So this is the hot part of this, uh, the skillet handle, which connects, and this is the, the tip. So what did we do for the model for this, based on entirely back-of-the-envelope instructions? All right? So the first thing we did is we turned this skillet handle into a cylinder with circular cross-section. We filled in the hole, and it can be justified. The next thing we did is we approximated heat transfer coefficients for an infinite cylinder. Next thing we did is we found that the BO number was small, so we could neglect temperature variations transversely, and we turned it into a one-dimensional parabolic PDE. Okay. And how does it work? Well, we measured temperatures point-wise at a series before the hole, and then at the hole in the chamfer, and then at the center plane here. And how do we do after all of those simplifications? Well, we don't do so shabby. All right, the black is the back of the envelope prediction for the temperature as a function of position. This is before the hole. This is after the hole on the chamfer where you have singularities due to this sharp chamfer. And this is uh, on the planar or flat surface. And you see that we predict quite well despite all those simplifications. Why? Because they're all justified. All right. And if we look at the temperature as a function of time at the grip, so this is when you would be at the scolding temperature and this is be where you'd be safe. You can see that we actually predict this is the back of the envelope, and this is the validation experiment we predict very well. Okay? So the back of the envelope is not ad hoc, uh, and uh, it can be done for many problems and achieve uh, very successful results. Not all results. Some are beyond the envelope, okay? and you have to know when that is. All right. So uh, what I'd like to close with is two short sections about how a uh, numerical solution of PDEs can, can play a role in future versions of the back of the envelope. So the first is the heat transfer coefficient. Uh, here's the mathematical formulation. I showed you experiments before for the heat transfer coefficient. We're only in the fluid, Boussinesque, and the temperature is fixed on the wall. Remember, that's the beauty. We can decouple the heat transfer coefficient from the ultimate application. And we then calculate the heat transfer coefficients as a Fourier flux appropriately normalized. And we can do it as a function of time or steady state. We non-dimensionalize as before. We have a Rayleigh number, a Prandtl number. The Nusselt number, here I have the correct subscript, is the uh, non-dimensional heat transfer coefficient. Uh, and uh, we can non-dimensionalize. You see the Rayleigh number and the Prandtl number as before. And we can then solve that problem numerically. This is at a Rayleigh number of 200,000. And here's the Nusselt number. Don't worry too much about function of time. It very rapidly reaches a steady state. The red line is the numerical computation. computation. The black dashed line is the churchill chu uh, correlation of experimental data. So you have a very good prediction. Uh, the uh, temperature field, this is a uh, NEC 5000 parallel spectral element solver developed by Paul Fisher. Uh, these are 8 by 8 resolution polynomial elements, so you have enough to go to much higher Rayleigh than I did here and still resolve the boundary layer. There's very interesting things happening in the fluid. You see this ghost-like plume that has detached from the top. Luckily, it has no pragmatic effect on the heat transfer once it departs, so it means that we can actually do these computations at relatively short times. This is a comparison as a function of Rayleigh number, computation versus experimental correlation, correlation of experimental data. Uh, this is the encapsulated function by which I calculated it. But we don't have to go out to such long time. And if we only go out to a time of five, uh, the wall clock time on a six processor MacBook Pro is less than a minute. With a little optimization for the efficiency, I think I could bring that down easily to a few seconds. All right. now, for the, again, for the, for the younger uh, uh, set of the audience who was not alive at the next date that I'll quote, just to give you a little perspective, in 1990, I had what I think was the fastest supercomputer on the MIT campus, which was an experimental version of the Intel Hypercube. Uh, on the right is Paul Fisher. Uh, and uh, we were running 2D calculations in many hours on this supercomputer. And Paul had to be in the loop. He had to have his hand on the kill switch. All right? So things were not quite as reliable as these days and we needed heavy duty resources. Same calculations are done MacBook Pro. The software evolved 20 years later and I can leave it alone and it actually converges. All right, so there's been a great deal of progress in the intervening time, uh, but are we there? No, we're not there. Why are we not there? Well, I showed you 2D calculations. I think 2D calculations when the flow is 2D and not unstable to 3D disturbances, uh, that that could be uh, largely automated with calculations and would agree 
within a percent of experiments. So that could effectively be a new way of computing and introducing Nusselt numbers into the back of the envelope. 3D calculations are different. I can actually do the 3D calculation with Paul's software on my MacBook Pro. Uh, this is a finite cylinder, but it takes on the order of four or five hours. And it's still not a turbulent Reynolds number. On a turbulent Reynolds number, uh, Paul does these calculations uh, with this code on tens of thousands of processors all right, in fully turbulent flow, but that's not ready for the back of the envelope. Right. So is there something we can do in between? Uh, and so that's my last topic, uh, which is a way in which not numerics from some years ago, but numerics from this current generation, if you like, many of you here, uh, can, be, uh, can be enlisted. Uh, this uh, part is about the reduced basis method. And uh, I've given you two references here, which are to two excellent textbooks which appeared recently, one of which co-authored by, by Professor Stamm here, uh, both highly recommended. Uh, so let me just remind you that these are the equations that govern the heat transfer coefficient. And we're going to consider a case different from what I have done before. This is an environmental uh, wall system that has an air gap. A hot temperature here, uh, actually a hot temperature here, a cold temperature here. The point is there's a temperature difference across this gap. And we'd like to calculate the Nusselt number as a function of that temperature difference. So the formulation still applies. I have to change slightly the temperature boundary conditions. And I've chosen as my uh, parameter of interest, not Rayleigh or Prandtl, but the angle of the wall with respect to gravity. So I have to replace my, my E2. Gravity was perpendicular to Y. Now it's more general. And my Nusselt number is slightly changed. But it's essentially the same formulation with Dirichlet, Dirichlet boundary conditions. And my Nusselt number is a function of data. So at high Rayleigh numbers, this is 10 to the 3, maybe uh, not too high yet, uh, we would like to do something faster than direct simulation. We'd like to do something that will return Nusselt numbers in milliseconds. Uh, this is to give you a sense. We'll be looking at a Rayleigh of 10 to the 3. The flow is boring when, the, uh, when it's uh, stably uh, stratified, and then you get a bifurcation to a wavy flow uh, when you get towards an angle which corresponds to unstable stratification with, with hot below. So the hot air wants to rise, and that creates convection cells, which you can see. So uh, what is the reduced basis method in a nutshell? It's all based on the parametric manifold. I'll look at the steady state. If you think of our velocity and our temperature, you can think of it as lying, say you have a, a, a three, million, 3 million degree of freedom discretization of this problem for velocity and temperature. Well then, your solution is a point in this, I forgot what I said already, but uh, 3 million uh, dimensional space. All right? uh, and the point is that that's a little bit daunting. All right? But you have to remember that we're interested in this as a function of a parameter, which is the angle of gravity. So what that means is that, yes, it's a member of a high dimensional finite element of spectral energy, but it also lies on a manifold, which is one dimensional, which is this solution swept out as a function of my single parameter of interest. So in fact, the solution in this very high dimensional space is a one dimensional manifold. So you can then compute snapshots on this manifold. We do that again with NEC 5000. Uh, we take time goes to infinity and that gives us stable steady states on this manifold. So we now can construct an approximation focused on the part of this very high dimensional space which is actually of interest for this particular parametric problem of interest. And as you saw, all of my PDEs in this talk were parametric, so all of those PDEs would be amenable to a similar kind of analysis. So here are the bare necessities uh, very bare necessities. So first you need reduced basis spaces. They're hierarchical and they're chosen to be n-dimensional and they're chosen to be a subspace of the span of the snapshots. So I've taken these green dots, I take a subset, I take the span and that's my space. There are two methods. The weak greedy is the better method. It's more economical in terms of truth calculations. In this uh, set of calculations, which are relatively recent, we just started with proper orthogonal decomposition. The weak greedy requires an a posteriori error indicator, and both the weak greedy and this a posteriori error indicator were first applied to nonlinear Boussinesque Navier Stokes uh, by Professor Veroy some years ago uh, in these references. Uh, once you have your spaces, you apply a standard Galerkin or Petrov Galerkin projection, and you have your approximation. You then need a structural assumption, which is that your equation, your partial differential equation, can be written as an affine sum of operators where the affine, the affine refers to functions of the parameter. So this does not depend on parameter plus a function of parameter times an, an operator which does not depend on parameter plus another function of parameter times another operator which does not depend on parameter. So if you have this expansion for that space, then you can perform an 
online, uh, offline, online decomposition, where the online complexity is independent of the underlying dimension. So if you had a 30-dimensional finite element space and you need 10 snapshots to represent the field, then the cost in the online stage scales with 10. It doesn't scale with the 10 million. So the online stage is very fast. Uh, what does that mean? These techniques are most relevant in the real time and many query context. In the real time context, you say, I want my answer right away. I'm willing to spend the weekend in order to prepare. In the uh, many query context, you say, I'm going to be solving this problem another thousand times, and I'm willing to amortize a weekend of effort over all of those solutions. Well, real time and many query, of course, are both adjectives which apply to the back of the envelope. So this would be the kind of technique that could be used to develop very fast heat transfer coefficient evaluators for these geometries. So how does this actually work in practice? So this is the Nussel number, remember, non-dimensional heat transfer coefficient, as a function of the angle of the wall in degrees. And uh, this is the boring solution. It's basically just conduction. And it does some rather uninteresting things. And then at about 20, there's a bifurcation to the wavy flow that I showed you on the original pictures. Uh, the uh, red uh, magenta, uh, magenta, excuse me, the magenta circles are the truth calculation, NEC 5000. Uh, the blue is a 14 dimensional uh, re reduced basis space. I'm sorry, blue is 16 and green is 14. The 16 is chosen based on considerations of the POD spectrum, should give us an accurate result, and it does. You also see there's a sense of convergence and stability. And you'll notice, for example, that when you go from 14 to 16, you actually pick up the bifurcation point. You almost see the square root much more accurately than you did uh, for the lower resolution. So these methods are, are, are quite uh, applicable uh, in uh, general problems like this. Uh, but where we're really headed, and I did not get, we got first results, but not yet quite satisfactory to show today, is uh, when we're looking at chaotic flows, unsteady flows, and ultimately turbulent flows, which is where Paul's Fisher group has expertise. Uh, and so the next target is a Reynolds number of 10 to the 4, where we no longer have steady states, but we have statistically stationary states as a precursor to what we would consider to be a fully three-dimensional turbulent flow. Now, uh, the uh, unsteady, uh, for unsteady problems, the reduced basis method, in fact, is quite well developed, and that first reference up there, 23, is in fact to Martin Greppel, who did some of the first work in parameterized model order reduction for parabolic PDEs. Uh, but more recently, Tommaso today and others with Paul's group have developed techniques which are also applicable to chaotic flows. And there we have to use different definitions of error indicators because we can't expect strong convergence, and we have to have different ways to develop the spaces, and we plan to apply those to these uh, kinds of flows. And ultimately, it seems that heat transfer coefficients should be uh, largely amenable to computation over a large range of, of, of Rayleigh numbers and flow regimes. So uh, just back to the perspective. Why do we need to teach students uh, back of the envelope analysis? Well, I would say that if you've done a calculation and you don't have a companion back of the envelope uh, calculation as an accompaniment, that there's a good chance you're not getting the answer. I would say over my career, I would say 30% of the simulation results presented to me were not right. All right, And you can usually catch that because you have at least an estimate to within a factor of two, and you have then a reference, not for precision, but in a reference for absence of blunders. And that's also why engineers, still, engineers love beams. That's the structural analog of a fin and the dunking problem. You give an engineer a structural problem. If it doesn't agree with the beam calculation, it's probably wrong. Okay. Uh, I mentioned already the single screen. Uh, uh, how can we study back of the envelope through undergraduate education? Almost all the examples I showed you were my undergraduate examples. Yes, they're very ingenious, uh, and, and, uh, but, but they have helped me to develop uh, this more formal structure, and they themselves have become uh, masters of, of exercising these simplification techniques. How can we benefit from computation? Well, we can start to calculate uh, heat transfer coefficients in complex geometries using direct stimulation, but also reduced basis techniques is one example. And is it fundamentally a human activity? Well, I think human ingenuity will be difficult uh, to replicate, but I don't think it will be difficult to replicate uh, the actual formal simplification process, uh, either a rule-based system or a learning system in which various pieces are separated out. And as I mentioned, uh, I do think that on the basis of the foundations that we're trying to put in place empirically within these educational contexts, at some point, certain activities that are now relegated to engineers and to humans and to students uh, will be able to be done uh, as, uh, as, uh, on an, through an artificial agent. And on that, uh, I thank you very much. Thank you.